So right after World War II, we really had a technological boom take place in the American economy. Now, it's not the technological age that we now know with cell phones and everything being based in the internet and Wi-Fi, but it really set the stage for what we know as our modern American culture. So we have all these factories that were built for wartime, all these people that now needed to be employed. So we have this next level industrial revolution where technology really was the thing that started to take over the economy of our culture. So now with the new advances of computers, again, computers back then were not what we know now as supercomputers in our pocket. It was computers that would fill an entire room like this. But they thought, how can we leverage this technology in every industry? So there was some psychologists that had these ideas back in the 20s of if we're able to use technology in the education system. So one man named B.F. Skinner took all those thoughts, consolidated them, then worked with some designers of these computers and developed something called the teaching machine. Have you ever heard of this before? Here's a picture of a teaching machine. Do we have this? So here's this teaching machine. So open it up, and inside there was this giant vinyl disc, the, like one of the first records that were ever made. So you have these vinyl discs. So the thought was this. If we teach children the answers to these questions over and over again, through the redundancy, they'll learn how to solve problems. So, for example, it would say, the war between uh, England and America took place in 1812. When did the war between England and America take place? And you would type in 1812. That's how these teaching machines worked. Now, you couldn't advance in this vinyl record unless you got the answer right. So when it would play, if you got it wrong, it would literally repeat the question over and over again until you got it right. Well, they saw the test scores skyrocket for all these students. And they were advancing through these teaching machines in the 50s until the 60s came. And in the 60s, they started to introduce new types of testing. Critical thinking skills were going to be tested. And the kids failed miserably. And as they started to test these students, they realized that they learned how to answer questions, not solve problems. They learned how to answer all these questions, but the moment the question was outside of the scope of what they learned, they had no idea how to solve anything. And then literally overnight, this technology disappeared. Now, we know parts of it in regards to uh, you know, modern technology, computers and whatnot, but one scholar, as they look back at this, wrote this and said, first it was movies, then teaching machines and programmed instruction, and finally now computers. All of these technologies failed in part because they distanced the student from a living, breathing teacher. The aha they understood was it doesn't matter how advanced this machine is. It's not living. It's not active. There is something inside of us that needs a mentor, that needs a teacher, that needs a guide, not just information. It needs to be more than some mechanized system that trains, equips, and teaches us. Because guess what? We're not machines. We're people. We're not just some design that's meant to be put on a shelf on a box. We are human beings that are living, breathing, and active. And see, it's unique in John chapter 14 when Jesus is about to make his departure, he introduces a strange concept to the disciples. And he starts to talk about the activity of the Spirit. John 14, verse 26, he says this, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. See, he's trying to get this concept across to the disciples that I'm in this finite earth suit. I'm about to go to the Father, and of course I'll be with you always to the end of the age, but I'm going to send my Spirit to empower you. And more importantly, to teach you. Now, when I heard this illustration of the teaching machines this week, I heard the Holy Spirit just whisper, whisper to me ever so softly. Why is it that we think that we can substitute the work of my spirit with seminars and sermons? What is it in us that we think we can achieve sanctification on our own? Have you ever noticed that about ourselves? We love the way that we do things and often resist the way that God does things. 
See, there's something in us that we think we can achieve sanctification, becoming like Jesus through seminars and services on a Sunday. But that's really like saying, I can do my own plastic surgery. Anybody here ever want to perform surgery on themselves? Why are you so excited? It's facelift Friday. Just going to go carve it up in the mirror. No, we, we know that there are certain things that need to be done by the hands of someone else. And for a lot of us, we take our process and our journey of growth and maturity into our own hands when they're never meant to be ours in the first place. The Holy Spirit is the one that teaches and guides us. He's the one that has to lead us in this process of sanctification. What Paul says in Romans chapter 8 at the end, he says, you're being conformed to the image of Christ. And so here's this master potter that's shaping you and molding you and forming you, and we resist it so well. We love to resist it. But as Paul said in Romans 8 verse 14, so well, or 8, 16, which one of those? Some, of the, some verse right there, 8, 14. As many are what? As many as are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. That word led is an aggressive term. You know, when we think of leadership or leading someone, we think of like, you know, that, that, that parent that's trying to convince their child. Come on. Come over here. One, two. Come over here. No, no, no. Don't touch that. It literally means to be arrested by. That's the context. It's saying, I surrender my will over to the leadership of this individual. That's the picture that Paul's painting. Will you surrender your will to the Holy Spirit's instruction? See, now there's a unique method that the, will, the, the Holy Spirit uses for our development. And we find it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says that as Jesus left his baptism, the Spirit led him where? The wilderness. There's something about the wilderness that Jesus loves to use in our life. Now, I don't know about you, but when you think of wilderness and the Spirit leading you into the wilderness, these pictures of like a prayer retreat come into your mind. Do you ever think about that? Now, you think about like the Holy Spirit leading you somewhere. You're like, you know what? That sounds, a rest sounds really good. Just getting alone with God. And this is often what we think of as a wilderness retreat. Do we have that picture here? You have a sunset. You have chairs. You have your coffee. But no Wi-Fi. Because that would be way too little. You know, that, that would really be interfering. Too much world in my, my spiritual retreat. See, the wilderness that Jesus is led by the Spirit into looked literally like this. It's a desertous dry land. There's no awesome water streams and shade trees that you sit under and your hammock that you swing on in between your devotional time. It was him and the spirit, and that's it. That was the wilderness. It was the Judean wilderness that the spirit led him to. And I don't know what it is, but God uses the wilderness to get us to our promised land. I don't care what story you look at in the Old Testament or some in the New where there's not a wilderness after their Egypt. See, we think that we can skip the process and jump straight to the promised land without the wilderness. But let me just let you into something. Even Jesus had to do the wilderness. Even Jesus had to endure this wilderness, this pruning that takes place, because I believe it's the wilderness that gets the wild out of us. See, for a lot of us, we come from captivity. We come from Egypt like Israel, and God uses the wilderness to shave the world off of us. See, because the promised land that he wants to give to you, your old self can't handle it. Your old self can't hold it. It's too heavy. It's way too strong. So he uses this wilderness process, and, and Deuteronomy really is the passage. If you've ever read Matthew 4, and you know the story here, Deuteronomy is kind of the textbook that Jesus quotes from. 
It's three chapters in particular. It's Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8. And again, for all of us linear thinkers, he quotes it out of order. Again, it's just how it works. But Deuteronomy 8 is really the anchor passage here. And this is what it says. 8 verse 2. Remember the long way the Lord your God has led you. Why is the wilderness never short? Have you noticed this about God? These wildernesses that he leads us on, they never take place overnight. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to what? To humble you. See, he's not trying to hurt you. He's humbling you because that haughtiness, that arrogance, that pride will kill you if not taken care of. It's the same thing that took Satan out as he stood in God's court. Why do you think he has so much power to tempt with those things? Because it's what owns him. He humbles you these 40 years, testing you to know what was in your heart and whether or not you would keep his commandments. See, he does this to, to, to form us into his image, and it's a difficult and brutal process. And a couple verses later in verse 5 of chapter 8, he, he literally says something that's requoted all throughout the Old and the New Testament. Know then in your heart that as a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord God disciplines you. We hate discipline. What is it in us? that just like, when you hear that, you're like, ooh. That will starts to rise up. Anybody with you? I don't need God's discipline. No, we need God's discipline. If you thought that thought, you need God's discipline. <laughs> if you think you've arrived, trust me, you have not arrived. If Paul hadn't arrived yet, then we definitely haven't arrived. See, there's this discipline that he takes us to, but we have to change our context. The way that we react to that word discipline is because we were often disciplined by fathers that failed us. You were disciplined by parents that failed you, or you grew up in a single-parent household, and that father abandoned you, or that mother abandoned you. So when we think of discipline, it brings up so much hurt. We have to remember that when we think of discipline in the eyes of God, think of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. We have a Father that doesn't fail us. We have a Father that is faithful. We have a God that has character, and he cares about you. And the best way to understand this, this dense word in the Hebrew is to know that this word discipline is used twofold. It's two different ways that it's used. It's discipline, which is to chastise and rebuke. And when Israel messes up big time, guess what he uses? That type of discipline. But there's also a secondary type, and this is what the writer of Deuteronomy is quoting. It's this discipline to teach or to train. See, God uses his discipline. The better way to understand that for us is to train you, to teach you. And the reason that I think the author doesn't put in train or teach is because we think it's going to be easy. Because our education system is easy and broken in many ways. See, when you think of discipline, I want you to think of going to the gym. You have that trainer where you know they won't let you cheat on those reps. How many know what I'm talking about? They're checking your heart rate the whole time. Man, you're not in the burning zone. What do you mean I'm not in the burning zone? I'm sweating. Not sweating enough. <laughs> See, the Holy Spirit is the one that has the heart monitor on, and he knows exactly where you're at all the time. You can see past that amazing, eloquent speech that you could put on for your teacher about how you forgot your homework. He knows exactly what you were doing all the time because he's watching you. He sees everything. He knows it, and he knows the thoughts behind it. See, that's the trainer. That's the coach. That's the person that's in our life. And the reason that he does this discipline is so that he can prepare you for the difficulty and danger of bringing kingdom to earth. We have to understand this. What kingdom or war has ever been won without difficulty and danger? So we think we can enter the promised land and it's going to be easy? 
See, when Jesus says, and again, depending on the gospel you're reading, you know, God's kingdom is coming, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, we have to understand what's taking place is that there is a spiritual war happening the entire time. And next time I I talk about this passage, you're going to see how Matthew sets this up to his sparring with the devil is the same literary structure he uses when sparring with the Pharisees. And he literally calls them, you know, the son of their father, Satan, later on. So Matthew's intentional in how he sets this up. You're in a spiritual fight to bring heaven to earth. See, we think it's this little tiny thing that we're doing here. You're shaking things up in the spirit. And there's fight that comes with it. Uh, My friend Patty, this week, as we're praying before the service, she says, it's been one of those weeks. Why is it one of those weeks? Because maybe the enemy knows that God's up to something. And see, what I love is he uses people like us because the enemy can't figure you out at all. You may think he can, but he can't because we are not rational beings. (laughs) You ever think you figured your spouse out enough and yet they surprise you? Preach. The moment he thinks that he's figured you out, you say yes to God in that thing that's held you captive for 20 years. And the math doesn't add up. God's having so much fun with him. He really is. But we have to surrender to the Spirit. We have to surrender to his leadership. We have to surrender to his teaching. And there is one thing we have to get over in order to say yes to the wilderness. See, the church has adopted a cultural ideal that really isn't healthy. I'm going to make some people mad here real quick. The church has adopted this idea that the world has fed my generation. And it's this idea that you're special. Have you ever heard that before? You are special. Do we have our special graphic? Look at our special graphic. <laughs> now, again, we have a VeggieTale household. I'm not talking about throwing out your VeggieTale books because they call your, God, your kids special and God says you're special. The issue is it's okay when you're a child, but you can't take this thinking into your adulthood. You can't take this thinking into your promised land. Otherwise, you end up looking like guys like this. If we take special thinking into our adulthood, yeah, I was just stumbling too many people right there. If we take special thinking into our adulthood, it will stunt the development that God has for you. And, and, and again, you're thinking to yourself, well, you're rolling through scriptures, you know, Psalm 139. Well, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm special. Yes, I understand what you're trying to get at, but it's a bad usage of the word. It just is. Special comes from this Latin term, which means species. And let me just tell you, if you take special thinking into your walk with Jesus, you think you can get out of things that other people have to go through. When you think special, you think, well, I don't have to suffer. When you think special, you think, well, I don't need that type of sanctification. See, special thinking thwarts you from entering the promises of God, and you get mad at God Because promises aren't happening. He says, you haven't even started the wilderness yet. See, what we have to understand, the biblical understanding is you're not special. You're significant. There's a difference. See, our culture is trying to fill the significant vacuum with specialness, and it doesn't fit. When you understand that you're significant, it literally means a sign that has meaning. And the whole context of this is something that was significant. It was this sign that pointed to something with a greater purpose. Here's the definition of meaning. Do we have that as well? Meaning is this, having intentions of a specified kind. See, when you believe you came from slime and don't have a destiny, you can't feel that vacuum of significance. But when you're designed with a purpose and a God that has a plan, you can start to walk in that identity of significance. That's the context here, and we can't 
prevent the wilderness from happening just because we think we're special. You're significant, but guess what? If anybody was truly special, it was Jesus, and even he had to endure it. Final phrase here before I invite up Patty. It says, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And all you scripture, you know, people here are like, well, God doesn't tempt anybody. You quote James 1. God doesn't tempt anyone. See, Matthew is so brilliant. He uses the word where it literally means test and temptation. Both testing and temptation. And see, what the Spirit of God does is, is God doesn't set you up to fail. See, the Spirit of God leads you to be tested, but the devil tries to leverage that testing with temptation. Because he knows if he can get you to fail, you won't follow through. If he can get you to fail, if he can get you to bite the bait, you'll never get to that promised land. Because you know why? He did it with Israel. But Jesus finishes what Israel could not. And that's the victory we stand on the side of. See, Israel had Moses. We got Jesus. <laughs> and we get to stand in that confidence. And it's from that place where we know we're going to fail. We know we're going to mess up. And see, the devil knew that they were disqualified. But now God says you're qualified through the sacrifice of Jesus. You're approved of. This is a big deal. And when we enter our wilderness, we have the hope of getting through it because we have the promises of Jesus. And I guarantee the writer of Hebrews was reading Matthew's letter when he wrote this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Jesus understands. Don't be afraid to bring up your trouble to him. Stop resisting that lie that says, God's finished with me. He doesn't have patience for me anymore. It's just not true. He understands, and he's able to sympathize. He's able to care because guess what? He was tested. And he was tested again. It wasn't just these 40 days. He was tested throughout his entire journey to the cross. And he came out victorious. Final quote here from a scholar who says this. Jesus, the true son of God, mirrors Israel's experience in coming out of Egypt. Matthew chapter 2. Is tested in the wilderness and remains obedient to God, specifically refusing to worship another. Will we stay faithful in worshiping God, even when our wilderness is breaking us down? Will we stay faithful in the midst of the testing and temptation? Will you call out to him and not give up? This morning, I have my good friend who's lived through a few tests, through wildernesses, and I hope that her story gives you Encouragement. Would you welcome Patty Deshaw as she shares? Come on. Hi. Um, who here knows me? Has heard my story? Knows me, heard my story. <laughs> okay. Um, let me say one thing. One thing I noticed about this scripture yesterday when I was mulling it over in me is that Jesus, the Father from heaven, validated him right before he went into the wilderness. It was a Kairos moment where he knew who he belonged to, he knew who he was, and he was loved, and God said, I'm pleased with you, son. And then the Holy Spirit <laughs> led him into the wilderness. So um, just so that you would know that Jesus also knows how it feels for you. 
He needed validation. Did he need it? Mm, maybe. He got it. So we need that. Okay. So what I'm going to share with you is my story plus some stuff. And I'm going to mostly read it or I won't be able to talk. So having been healthy and a runner for 30 years, I started AAU track and field when I was 10 years old. So from 10 to 40, I ran city track. It was fun. And um, I was preparing for a marathon. I had just moved to Kansas City. I was starting to prepare for a marathon. And um, I started getting sick. I contracted an autoimmune disease, spending time, energy, and finances attempting to find a cure. I became more ill by the day, life-threatening weight loss and literally starving. I couldn't drink water without getting sick. I weighed 85 pounds. 18 months of extreme pain and fatigue, wondering how would I care for my husband, John, in the front row, and my five-year-old partially disabled son, Cart, in the front row. Love you, Cart. Glad to be your mom. My last option for survival was major surgery to remove my large intestine. I really wanted to die. Scary but necessary surgery because there were no medications then that could put this illness into remission like there are now. After a botched surgery, yeah, botched, where am I? It saved my life, but it messed me up. And a month in the hospital, I spent eight more months in more pain than before the botched surgery. A second opinion from a surgeon made it clear that I should pursue Cleveland Clinic in Ohio to repair what he had, what the guy had messed up. And you know, I could have taken him to court. No, I was looking for Jesus in the middle of it. So I repeated the procedure, but this time with the surgeon who was recognized at the best, as the best in his field in the world. And that was really God's provision because our health insurance said, yes, we'll financially cover that whole process, probably $150,000 worth, even though it's out of network. So after the successful redo and three months to recover, I had a final surgery and thought, okay, I'm done. Let's move on with my life. And a year later, I needed another major surgery. Back to Cleveland Clinic, I went. Complications often follow long-term illness, and I was no different than anyone else. I began to have an abnormal heart rate, and I decided that instead of being anxious, I was going to stop mid-sentence, like if I was having a conversation, I would stop mid-sentence, and I would say, Jesus, I love you, and I trust you with my life. And he answered with a deep reassurance of his love for me. In the beginning of all the trauma, yeah, I wondered, why me? I've been good. I was a good Catholic. <laughs> How could you let this happen to me? I've been so good. And what I saw so clearly, and this was 1.30 in the morning one night where I had, after the botched surgery, I had to sleep sitting up propped on the couch because I couldn't lay down. It was too painful. So those two months of agony and fighting with God and saying, <laughs> how dare you? I promise you, God can handle your I dare you. He can handle it. He'd rather have you do that, be real, than not say anything. So I was pretty desperate. I saw the depravity of my own heart of the, I'm an American, and this is really American. I deserve a happy life. We're fed that as kids here. And, you know, granted, I grew up on the other side of the tracks in L.A. I still felt like I deserved a happy life. I was angry. I was desperate. Those around me became uncomfortable with my neediness, afraid that they would say or do something wrong. So they simply stayed away. And I was really alone. My family was 5,000 miles away and didn't come. 
Then one day, isn't that the great part of the story? Then one day, after many months in the house of prayer in Kansas City, five days a week, two hours a day, I was in the prayer room pouring my guts out to God, asking him to heal me. Why didn't he want to heal me? And one day, that day, one of those days, I knew that I knew that I knew that I wasn't alone and that I would never be forsaken because scripture promises. I knew that God can only be good. He can't be anything else. If he says he's good, he's good. So from then on, my heart softened and I knew his presence more deeply than ever. He loved me, and whatever bruising he allowed in my life, he also promised to heal. That's in Isaiah. On this side of heaven, but definitely on the other side. I knew that nothing touched me without touching him first, and nothing I experienced would be wasted in the kingdom. I spoke truth to myself regularly, daily, hourly, the medication-induced couch time and sleepless nights. Be, uh, sorry. The medication-induced couch time, sleepless nights were filled with his presence. He would sing songs to me like, Hush, my darling, don't fear, my darling, the lion sleeps tonight. Because you know the lion, he's looking for someone to devour. I knew that he was my safe haven. On one occasion, after I was at the um, IHOP, I was walking in a parking lot. I still had groceries to get. I still had laundry to do. I still had stuff to do. I was getting out of my car, and I felt this tap on my shoulder, and I looked back to see who it was, and there was no one in the parking lot but me. And it was God reminding me, I'm still here, I'm still here. I'm never going to leave you. He made it clear that he was always near. And as I embraced my suffering, my perspective changed. And I realized that weakness, physical or emotional, is not our enemy. Weakness is not your enemy. God is attracted to weakness. He runs to those who humbly admit their need. I needed him desperately. My prayer for release from the agony changed to God. Please don't let me out of this oven until I have everything you want for me out of it. His voice, his word, his friendship, his fragrance had become so precious to me. I was willing to be encompassed by anything in order to have him. I'm going to describe one surgery um, I went in for uh, this, the prepare, repair surgery at, it was supposed to be like a 6.30 p.m. surgery. And um, I waited, and I waited, and I'm, you know, I'm IV'd, I'm ready. And I waited, and I waited, and they kept wheeling in. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, by the way, is, is like Mayo. Hi, hi, everybody wants to go there to get healed or fixed, whatever. Um, I waited and waited, and my poor husband is out in the waiting room not knowing, did she go into surgery yet? Okay, so seven hours later, 1.30 in the morning, finally, I'm in the operating room, and I'm laying there calm. Jesus was there. I, he wasn't going to let that guy take me out, even if he didn't have any sleep. He wasn't going to do it. So I'm laying there, and now there are two anesthesiologists, one on each side, trying to find an IV site because the one on my hand blew, and they had to find another one. And I was so dehydrated, because, you know, you don't eat, drink before surgery. So um, I was so dehydrated. Two of them are working on me, looking in my head, looking in my neck. So I'm being poked like crazy. And I look down to the bottom of my feet, and I see the nurse strapping my feet onto the table, and I go, oh, you really do that? Strap us on? And they were startled, because I was paying attention. I should have been freaking out, right? Wouldn't you have been freaking? I should have been freaking out. But I was at so much peace. 
So then I'm listening to the music, and I go, oh, the surgeon likes country music. They had music playing, and, and um, I see my surgeon through the window. He keeps looking in, like, is she ready? Is she ready? Because <laughs> he hasn't had any sleep. So, um, I, and I'm chuckling with them, and they're looking at me like, who is this lady? Anyway, so the anesthesiologist says, okay, Mrs. Deshaw, we found a spot. We're ready to go. Start counting. Well, I had, you know, they have you count back from 100. I had decided, okay, counting. Uh, no, no, no. I need something else. So I had a song that always was in my head. My hope is built, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'd get to the end of that, and I was out. <laughs> so I'd sing that every time. So as I'm singing that, the anesthesiologist, this one here, is looking at me like, what? who is this person? All that to say, I was at peace. I was afraid, yeah, but I was at peace. You can be afraid, you can be in pain, and you can be at peace. You, you don't have to be kicked in the head by the enemy. Um, he wants to kick you in the head, but anyway. So I won't be running any marathons, bummer, or eating many of my favorite foods until I eat them with him in eternity. I still have pain five days out of seven. And my health is compromised. But I would walk it all again just to find him. My heart soars at the sound of his voice. And his pleasure in me is at times overwhelming. He sees the bullseye on my heart and he aims for it every day. I do this to some of you guys sometimes. He's aiming. And I believe that God has a plan to heal me. He's going to heal me. He promised he would. He's going to heal me. It might not be on this side of heaven, but it definitely will be on the other side. And he's going to heal my son. We hope on this side of heaven, but for sure on the other side. And so I'm not going to stop praying for people to get healed up here. Because I know how my God feels about me. And I'm not going to stop. And I heard the Lord, been hearing the Lord say all morning long to say to you, the tough times are going to happen. You can't get out of it. Your peaceful little life that you want doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. It's a fairy tale, and it's a lie that the enemy has used to keep you from loving Jesus with everything you've got in you. I love him with everything I've got in me. I used to dance in the prayer room in Kansas City. I had an ostomy, that is a stoma. I was 40 years old. That's for old people. I was 40 years old, and I would dance across the room holding my stoma because it hurt. And I'd have people coming up to me all the time saying, crying, crying to me, looking at me. I can't believe you're doing this, Patty. I can't believe. And I'm going, what? I'm just worshiping Jesus. Because the rest of it didn't really, it existed, and I was in pain. But God taught me how to live above it. You can. You can. We can live above it. We only do it one day at a time and one choice at a time. But we can live above it. Well, let's stand together as we pray. I'm going to have Patty pray for us. Just stay standing. You know, I'll be here on a, on a Sunday morning, and I'll watch Patty praying with people that are in tremendous pain. Stay standing. That's not done yet. And uh, I know the pain Patty's in as she's praying for people. And it's the most beautiful thing as a church that believes for healing. We trust the Lord in the process. And there are things we don't understand. We don't get his timing. But we trust him. We trust him in that process. We trust him in that journey. Let's just close our eyes as we, as we pray this morning. I'll have Patty pray here in a second. God, we just pray for grace. God, we thank you for the tests that you bring our way. And God, we ask that we would not fall subject to the enemy's temptation. Lord, that we can trust you in the journey. We can trust you in the process that as you are faithful, help us remain faithful. So right now with eyes closed, you say, you know what? You're in the middle of a serious test. You're in a trial 
and you need God's grace and strength. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Keep your hand up. Father, we just pray right now for strength to fill this house. Empower your people. I'm going to have Patty pray for us. Lord, we ask you to help us settle in our hearts that you're a good God no matter what our lives look like. That you don't love someone else better than you love us. Lord, would you help us to recognize that everything you do in our lives has life in it. Everything you do produces life, Jesus. Would you help us to know that? God, I ask for my family here at The Rock that you would help us know that every situation, there's an invitation to trust you, an invitation to know you deeper, an invitation to really be near you like we want to be. We want to know you. God, help us to make peace with that truth that you're always here, that you will never, never, never leave us to face life alone, ever. And that we've never, ever been alone. God, I ask for a time this week for my family to know that they know that they know that you're the God who loves them, who runs to them when they say, I'm struggling, I'm weak. This week, I ask for a divine appointment for each person in this room to know you in a bigger way. And Lord, we ask, we take authority over the enemy right now and we say no to your confusion. We say no to that spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. We say no to the lies that tell us, ah, you're nobody. We say no to that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we make peace with the truth we belong to you and that makes us significant we thank you for loving us so well Jesus come and do what only you can do in us in Jesus name amen